Um, as you all know that uh, our keynote speaker at this conference is Professor Nicholas Wille. Professor Wille, can you hear us? Yes, hello. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning, Professor. Uh, thank you for joining us here. Of course, Professor Wille, you know, uh, doesn't need an introduction. But I feel that I am obliged to say something about that. You know, uh, Nicholas Wille is professor uh, of international relations at the University of Birmingham. Uh, he specializes in security studies and focused his research on the security dilemma and humanitarian intervention. Um, some of his publications include uh, the the Security Dilemma, Fear, Cooperation, and Trust in World Politics, published by Palgrave Macmillan. Uh, another one, Saving Strangers, Humanitarian Intervention in International Society, published by Oxford University Press. And Trusting Enemies, Interpersonal Relationship in International Conflict, was published by Oxford University Press again. Um, he is also the author of numerous articles in journals, including International Affairs, Millennium Journal of International Studies, and International Political Science Review. Um, well, Professor Wheeler, welcome again. This is an hour-long panel. Uh, please allow us at least 15 minutes for Q&A session. Uh, and the floor is yours, Professor. Um, th thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to begin by uh, offering my thanks to CESRAN International uh, for this invitation to uh, address the 10th uh, Annual Conference on International Studies, uh, especially Professor Oscar Tepetsi, Professor Maraman Dar, and the organizing committee. I I'm really sorry that I can't be with you in person on this occasion, uh, but I'm very much looking forward to participating virtually with you all uh, this morning. I hope you can hear me okay and that uh, everything, and I've shared my screen, so um, we'll, we'll get underway. So the subject of nuclear crises needs no justification in the contemporary world order. The shadow of nuclear escalation hangs over the conflict in Ukraine, and it's widely accepted that nuclear risks are increasing as distrust dominates relations between the major nuclear armed states. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, the then US Secretary of State for Defense, Robert McNamara, famously declared, there is no such thing as strategy, only crisis management. Yet what McNamara did not say was that what was critical to the de-escalation of the crisis, the closest the world has ever come to nuclear war, was the trust that developed during the crisis between President John F. Kennedy and his Soviet counterpart, Nikita Khrushchev. As their two countries teetered on the brink of nuclear conflict, the two leaders came to recognize a shared responsibility to prevent global catastrophe. They communicated this to one another through a series of letters that exhibited empathic communication and a bond developed as a result, creating the trust that was so critical to the peaceful ending of the crisis. This trust-based interpretation of the ending of the Cuban Missile Crisis is based on my 2021 article, The Strength of Weak Bonds, in the European Journal of International Relations, co-authored with Marcus Holmes. And much of what I'm gonna say this morning draws on our extensive collaborative work together, including a recent paper we have written on the potential for empathy and trust in nuclear crises. In my 2018 book, Trusting Enemies, that was kindly mentioned in the introduction, I developed a theory of interpersonal trust to explain how trust can emerge between the leaders of two adversary states. The starting point for our new piece is the counterintuitive proposition that such trust can emerge in moments of extreme danger between two nuclear armed states. And the case that best supports this claim is the Cuban Missile Crisis. What I want to do in this lecture is briefly set out the conditions that are necessary for such trust to develop. And here a key focus will be on the concept of security dilemma sensibility 
an empathic understanding of responsibility and conflict, first developed by Ken Booth, who's already been mentioned, of course, earlier, and myself in our 2008 book, The Security Dilemma, Fear, Cooperation and Trust in World Politics. In making the hopeful claim that trust can emerge in the shadow of nuclear destruction, it has to be critically recognized that there are no guarantees here and that the prevention of nuclear crises through robust risk reduction practices and processes remains the urgent global public policy challenge. I proceed in four parts. First, I argue that the development of interpersonal trust in nuclear crises dep depends upon the presence of two key variables. Security dilemma sensibility, a particular form of empathy, that is predicated on state leaders recognizing a shared responsibility for a conflict and humanization, where leaders recognize the humanity in their counterpart rather than the agent of an enemy state. Next, I want to sketch out in very general terms how SDS and humanization emerged in the Cuban Missile Crisis through the empathic form of communication that developed between Kennedy and Khrushchev. The third part of the lecture reflects on why it is that these components come into play in some nuclear crises and not others. Finally, by way of conclusion, I will identify some policy and research implications that emerge out of the lecture for managing and preventing nuclear crises. Here, I will briefly share some findings from the work of the basic ICCS Nuclear Responsibilities Program, where I am at basic a non-resident senior fellow in relation to our work on crisis management and crisis prevention in India-Pakistan nuclear relations. Let me begin then by exploring two key pathways to interpersonal trust between the leaders of two adversary states. The first necessary ingredient for trust to develop is the emergence of shared security dilemma sensibility. In 2008, Ken Boob and I defined security dilemma sensibility as, quote, an actor's intention and capacity to show responsiveness towards the potential complexity of the military intentions of others. In particular, it refers to the ability to understand the role that fear might play in their attitudes and behavior, including crucially, the role that one's own actions may play in provoking that fear. As can be seen from this definition, the exercise of security dilemma sensibility is predicated on an understanding that an adversary might be motivated by fear and insecurity rather than predatory intent. In developing this idea further, Holmes and I argued in our 2022 article in the Journal of Global Security Studies that SDS should be conceived as a variable and not a binary, as in the original formulation, and that what is crucial, crucial to trust emergence is that security dilemma sensibility is shared by both leaders. What Holmes and I call share, shared security dilemma sensibility arises when two adversaries have come to appreciate that each is exercising SDS towards the other. As we put it in our 2020 article that set out our theory of diplomatic social bonding, which will be the subject of a full length book, hopefully published next year, the intention and capacity to exercise security dilemma sensibility, quote, needs to be shared by his or her counterpart. And crucially, both sides need to know that, end quote. The logical corollary of this is that two leaders who share SDS can take concrete policy steps aimed at reassuring the other, that they are not seeking security at their expense. As a result, two leaders who share SDS would not would be looking for ways to reduce hedging so as to communicate their peaceful intentions to the other. Engendering SDS is not an easy feat, and there are two fundamental obstacles to its exercise. The first is what Booth and I call peaceful defensive self-images, and the second is the problem of decision makers imputing an inherent bad faith model to an adversary. Turning to the problem of peaceful defensive self-images, the historian Herbert Butterfield famously argued that leaders and diplomats 
were incapable of entering into the counter fear of an adversary. Because leaders with peaceful intent find it very difficult to understand why an adversary should feel threatened by their actions, because they believe that others know that their intentions are peaceful. But of course, adversaries are not so easily reassured. As the slide shows, a textbook illustration of this was US Secretary of Defense Caspar Weinberger's justification in 1983 of the recently announced US Strategic Defense Initiative that was aimed at protecting the US homeland from Soviet nuclear forces. In response to Soviet claims that SDI was aimed at providing the United States with a first strike capability, Weinberger replied that the Soviet Union had, quote, no need to worry about US plans for missile defense because they know perfectly well that we will never launch a first strike on the Soviet Union, end quote. Soviet decision makers, of course, had no such assurance, and they reacted to US protestations of peaceful intent with what they viewed as defensive military responses. The second fundamental obstacle to the exercise of security dilemma sensibility is the application of what Ol Holsty called an inherent bad faith model to an adversary's behavior. A particular actor's behavior is perceived as threatening and untrustworthy by virtue of certain inherent characteristics relating to its political identity and basic values. A bad faith model of an adversary gives rise to a particularly perverse outcome whereby negative behavior is seen as caused by inherent traits while discrepant information signaling apparently peaceful intentions are explained by situational pressures. The possession of SDS is incompatible with holding a peaceful defensive self-image and an inherent bad faith model. But even if leaders can exercise security dilemma sensibility, this in itself is no guarantee that an adversary's intentions are peaceful. Instead, it represents an openness to the possibility that the other side might be potentially trustworthy. SDS then is an intuitional belief that has to be tested out. And Holmes and I argue in our solo and collaborative work that interpersonal interaction, especially and most importantly, face-to-face -face encounters provide a crucial testing ground here as leaders attempt to probe the level of empathic understanding in each other. Shared SDS then opens up spaces for empathic communication and de-escalation in crisis situations, but for trust to develop, a further variable is necessary, and that is for a process of social bonding to take place. Building on Randall Collins's micro-sociological theory, Holmes and I argue that trust is an emergent property of a process of social bonding. Interpersonal trust that is built on purely calculative considerations is fragile and vulnerable to opportunistic behavior if payoffs change. By contrast, interpersonal trust that emerges out of a process of social bonding, where leaders come to make a positive identification with the other and see the human in their counterpart rests on much stronger foundations. In Trusting Enemies, I defined a positive identification of interests as a process in which, quote, state leaders no longer think of their interests being autonomous, even if congruent. Instead, they see the other's interests as their interests and the other's security and well-being as their security and well-being, end quote. The other key component of social bond formation is humanization. Humanization involves, quote, seeing the human in their counterparts' attitudes and behavior rather than just a representative of cold state interests, end quote. Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev coined the term the human factor to capture his experience with Ronald Reagan of how personalized diplomacy can break down barriers to cooperation that exist at the interstate level. I argue in my 2018 book that if a process of identity transformation between two adversaries reaches a certain point 
which drawing on the work of the trust researcher Guido Mollering, I call trusted suspension. Both leaders will suspend risk calculation in relation to the peaceful intentions of the other. Suspension is a mental or psychological state in which leaders are so secure in their trust with each other that neither calculates the risks of defection in relation to the other's intent and integrity. Instead, they share a relationship of what I call bonded trust. In our new article, and speaking directly to my topic this morning, Holmes and I expand our earlier focus on psychological trait explanations of why some leaders possess more SDS than others to encompass a structural explanation rooted in nuclear fear. Kenneth Waltz famously argued that nuclear deterrence, quote, depends on fear. Relatedly, it is commonly argued in works on crisis management that it is the shared fear of nuclear war on the part of two nuclear armed states that has prevented past crises from escalating into a major conflict. Some strategists have even gone further, espousing a nuclear superiority thesis, arguing that the side with the greatest nuclear capabilities has a bargaining advantage that allows it to manipulate the shared risks of nuclear war in ways that allow it to, quote, win in a crisis. Neither of these nuclear fear-based explanations depend on interpersonal trust, except the very thin trust that the other side can be trusted not to behave irrationally, and neither assume any form of social communicative interaction between leaders. The only communication at work here is material nuclear signaling, as each seeks in Glenn Snyder's well-known formulation, quote, to coerce prudently and accommodate cheaply. However, the Cuban Missile Crisis, as I now want to briefly discuss, appears to tell a different story of how nuclear crises might end. Holmes and I argue that it was the cultivation of shared security dilemma sensibility, where both leaders understood and empathized with each other's fears, leading to interpersonal trust, that was crucial to the peaceful ending of the crisis. As the United States and the Soviet Union, represented by their respective leaders, Kennedy and Khrushchev, stood at the brink of nuclear war, a bond of limited trust developed between them that became possible because of shared security dynamic sensibility, positive identification of interests and humanization. What made the development of this social bond possible was the empathic nature of the communication between the two leaders. Through a series of written correspondences, both leaders managed to forge a connection and navigate a peaceful end to the crisis. The evolution of this bond and the trust it made possible is remarkable, considering the palpable sense of fear, suspicion and distrust that marked their initial interactions particularly their one and only face-to-face -face meeting at the Vienna summit in June, 1961. Khrushchev's letters made him appear more as a fellow human, imploring Kennedy to recognize and act upon their shared responsibility to manage and de-escalate the crisis rather than just the Soviet premier. This thread of solidarity between the two men with the power to start a nuclear war only strengthened as both leaders continue to imagine and share with each other the grim realities of a potential nuclear conflict. The trust play, this trust played a crucial role in the crisis's resolution. As Kennedy began to trust Khrushchev, despite the earlier betrayal of the Soviet leader's promise not to deploy missiles to Cuba. Moreover, Khrushchev demonstrated a significant amount of trust in Kennedy expressing belief in Kennedy's public promise not to invade Cuba and in his secret pledge to remove, to remove US intermediate range ballistic missiles from Turkey. Nevertheless, the bond and trust that developed between them was not absolute. Both leaders continued to hedge and calculate their risks in case the crisis escalated into a military confrontation. 
risk suspension in this case did not obtain fully, but it was sufficient for the two leaders to climb down the ladder of escalation rather than seek to manipulate the other's fears by increasing the risk of nuclear conflict. For all the theorizing of nuclear risk manipulation by US strategists at the time, when it came to a crisis involving flesh and blood human beings, what loomed large for Kennedy and Khrushchev were the catastrophic human consequences of any use of nuclear weapons. Let me turn then to some implications and questions that arise from the Cuban case. Here I want to focus on two questions. First, if nuclear fear is a key enabler of leaders in a crisis, developing security dilemma sensibility and trust, why hasn't shared security dilemma sensibility and trust developed in other similar cases? Second, if SDS and trust do not come into play in a nuclear crisis, what are the implications of this for crisis de-escalation? Turning to the first question, it is pertinent to ask why Kennedy and Khrushchev were not able to develop the same level of trust during the October 1961 Berlin crisis, where US and Soviet tanks confronted each other only a few hundred yards apart at Checkpoint Charlie that they were to achieve a year later during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Is the answer that the Berlin crisis did not reach an equivalent level of threat to that of Cuba? And so the mechanism of nuclear fear producing SDS and trust did not come into operation. Although interpersonal trust was not present in the same way over Berlin as it would be over Cuba, it is the case that the leaders were able to communicate privately their fears to each other during this moment in October 1961, through a back channel that both Kennedy and Khrushchev trusted. And this was critical to the de-escalation of the crisis. India and Pakistan have experienced a series of crises with the potential to go nuclear, dating back to the 1986 brass tax crisis, when both sides had the potential to weaponize nuclear capabilities. The most recent was the 2019 Balakot crisis. With the partial exception of the de-escalation of the brass tax crisis in January 1987, there is no evidence that shared security dilemma sensibility and interpersonal trust were critical factors in the de-escalation of these crises. One interpretation of this finding, and this presents a response to the second question I posed above, is that the structural condition of nuclear fear is sufficient in itself to produce responsible behavior in nuclear crises, and that the presence or absence of shared SDS and trust is not a significant factor in explaining crisis de-escalation. For those who advance this view, the India-Pakistan relationship, like the superpower one during the Cold War, is in Marshall Shulman's famous term, an adversary partnership. Competition exists, but as with the US-Soviet conflict, it has to be conducted cautiously and responsibly given the shadow of nuclear destruction. It is true that the cooperative element has come to the fore in past nuclear crises, but can this be relied upon in the future? Perhaps as Benoit Pelopidis has strongly argued, we need to pay more attention to the factor of luck in successful crisis outcomes. Imagine the Cuban Missile Crisis played out with different personalities. How would October 1962 have ended had Donald Trump been in the Oval Office and Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin? Would they have colluded or collided? Now, this is not to say that leaders cannot ne negotiate de-escalation in a crisis where deep distrust dominates, but the risks of inadvertent, advertent, and accidental escalation will be that much greater when there is no shared conception of responsibilities and trust to navigate the perils of nuclear fear. Let me turn to a conclusion and in so doing, consider some of the policy implications that flow from the analysis I've offered here. I've argued that the lesson from October 1962 is that the severity of the nuclear threat faced during this event 
and the ensuing correspondence between Kennedy and Khrushchev illuminates how SDS and interpersonal trust can become instrumental in de-escalation. For trust to emerge in conditions of nuclear crisis and the intense fear this gives rise to, it is vital that leaders have channels of communication where they can empathically communicate, appreciating the unique responsibility they share to de-escalate the crisis. This is what Kennedy and Khrushchev were able to achieve through their written correspondence during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Achieving responsible crisis communications between nuclear adversaries remains an urgent public policy challenge. The problem in the India-Pakistan context is not that there are not formal channels of communication between the two adversaries. Rather, the problem is that neither side trusts in a crisis that the other will not use the channel for deceptive purposes. If both sides knew the channel was a trustworthy one, then this would allow leaders in a crisis to distinguish credible signals of each other's intent from the proliferation of information, especially in a context where nuclear jingoism and enemy imaging is likely to be rife in social and print media communications. The same distrust dynamic is bedeviling progress on crisis communications and escalation management between the United States and China. The Chinese government views US attempts to initiate a new dialogue on crisis communications as an attempt to stabilize and normalize what Beijing perceives as US provocative actions towards China. Conversely, the US government views China's reluctance to embrace such a dialogue as irresponsible in a context where the air and naval operations on both sides risks a collision as each seeks to defend what it sees as its legitimate security interests. There is no shared security dilemma sensibility here, let alone trust. And as a result, both sides have radically different conceptions of crisis management. Despite the deep conflict between Russia and the United States, some commentators have pointed out that Moscow continues to see value in having a trusted channel of communication with Washington, and that such a channel has been important for deconfliction purposes in relation to both Syria and Ukraine. This leads some to argue that it would take a Cuban missile crisis type encounter between the United States and China before Beijing is ready to enter into a dialogue over crisis communications. If so, this is an unhappy note on which to end because such a crisis, potentially over Taiwan, might not end in the peaceful de-escalation that Kennedy and Khrushchev were able to achieve in October 1962. One could easily imagine a situation with different leaders than Kennedy and Khrushchev who engaged in dangerous practices of nuclear brinkmanship, leading to escalation that could end in nuclear use. The extreme risk and potential for catastrophe associated with nuclear crises demand that they be avoided at all costs. I said earlier that engendering security dilemma sensibility was no easy thing in adversarial relationships, but it is a critical pathway to interpersonal trust, and trust is the ultimate antidote to nuclear risk manipulation. The challenge then is to avoid sailing in the seas of nuclear crisis altogether. And for this to happen, leaders in adversarial nuclear dyads, dyads have to look for ways to reassure rather than to intimidate through the proactive exercise of security dilemma sensibility. McNamara had it nearly right. There is no such thing as strategy, only crisis prevention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Vida, for the great speech. Um, if you allow me, the, let's carry on with the Q&A session. Uh, if you have any questions for Professor Vida, please raise your hand. Then please introduce yourself shortly and ask your question. Uh, please bear in mind that uh, questions should be short as well. Do you have any questions? 
Doktor Amanda. There's a mic over there. Yeah, why not? Nice come. Miga. Thank you. Hi Nick, can you hear me now? This is Roman from Sessor International. Yeah, hello, I can hear you. Thanks. Uh, uh, it was really great speech and theoretical. But I really would like to hear your answer about your imaginary question about the Ukraine-Russia war. What if the presidents of the uh, U.S. Uh, would be the Trump, Trump, Donald Trump and the Vladimir Putin? So what uh, would be uh, the reaction? Are they collude or colliding? That was your imaginary question about explaining the trust uh, between the leaders. So what's your answer to that question? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that, Roman. I think it's a really, it's a really interesting question. Uh, if I mean, if, if we're focusing just on Ukraine, um, if Trump was in the White House, uh, would U.S. policy uh, in relation to Ukraine uh, be the same uh, as it's been uh, under Biden? And I think the answer to that is that it wouldn't have been the same. Um, how much? It would have been different is, I think, a matter that we can debate and discuss. But I think it's highly plausible to think that there would have been a much stronger degree of collusion than, than collision. I think Trump would have been persuaded by those people uh, who want to argue that the real challenge is China and that the US should be not uh, uh, competing in this way uh, with Russia, because what's important is to pull Russia away from China and to be in a position where the United States can compete better with China by not in any way uh, encouraging China and Russia to move closer together. That view you know, associated with people like John Mearsheimer, for example, uh, I think would have been one that the people that he would most likely have had in the national security uh, bureaucracy would have been, uh, I think, uh, pushing on him. At the same time, of course, there's his own personal relationship with Putin, which is a complex one. So, uh, and then, of course, there would have been then uh, the dynamic that we can see already in the Congress, those people that think that too much money is going to support uh, uh, Ukraine uh, struggle against Russia, uh, and that uh, you know that should be cut back. U.S. military aid should be cut back, and that the scale of military aid should be cut back. There were voices, of course, in the Congress that that that, that are calling for that. And um, if Trump was in power, you could imagine those voices being much stronger. And and uh, so I think it would be it would have been a very different situation. Uh, uh, there would of course been countervailing pressures. And it would have been very, you know, there would have, of course, been countervailing pressures to support NATO, to uh, to to be seen to be defending these fundamental principles that have been breached. And so, you know, you can't, I'm not trying to say that it would be, I think it would have been a tension between those things. And Trump, of course, is the supreme, you know, pragmatist. Uh, he's not driven by ideological principles in any shape or form. So he would have been pragmatic where the political winds were blowing, he would have gone. But I think there would have been a strong inclination to play this differently in a Trump administration than a Biden one. Well, what do you think, Raman? Do you think that's a fair in analysis? Thank you very much. That, that was quite contrary to my approach to that's imaginary question, but it was convincing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you both. The other Is aspect of that, sorry, sorry, the other aspect of that, uh, the the other aspect of that of Raman's question though would be what about if the sorry, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. 
sorry, yeah, sorry. The, the other the other thing that I what I was getting at in my um, question about what, would it have been different was in, if there was to be a if there'd been a, a crisis in which uh, U.S vital interests were engaged in the same way as happened with Cuba uh, in 62. And uh, Russian vital interests had also been engaged in a future situation. How then would a crisis like that play out was what I was kind of wanting to explore as well. Because what I find very interesting about about the, the comparison, I've been thinking for a while about the comparison between Khrushchev's behavior uh, in October 1962 and Putin's behavior in relation to the rattling of the nuclear sabers and so on. And, you know, there was a lot of talk last year, you know, around the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis about, you know, whether there were any lessons from the crisis in terms of off ramps for Ukraine, trying to think about how the conflict might be de-escalated and the war brought to an end. And, you know, one of the striking things is that Put is how far Putin's approach to nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy appears to be quite a significant outlier with previous Soviet leaders, including Khrushchev. Now, whether that's rhetorical, ultimately, or whether in a crisis situation where the two, where the US and Russia were bumping up against one another, not in a proxy sense, but actually in a direct sense, would Putin be a nuclear risk taker in a very different way to which Khrushchev was? You know, Khrushchev had the option in 1962 to escalate the war to Berlin, where the Soviets had massive conventional superiority. And Kennedy was petrified during the crisis that Khrushchev might do that, that he might widen the conflict to Berlin. And that was a real fear for them. Um, and, and But Khrushchev wasn't that kind of risk taker. And ultimately, what, as I have argued, you know, what he was, uh, what was, critical for him was the need to de-escalate the conflict because he feared that they were losing control of it. But would Putin or, you know, another leader in the future with a very different psychological profile, perhaps, would they behave very differently? And then would we find ourselves in a nuclear crisis where both sides were then engaging in brinkmanship? Because if you had then had a leader, uh, in the White House, who was also an, a risk taker, who was also risk acceptant rather than risk averse like Kennedy, then, you know, would you get a very different dynamic? And that's why I think it's so important that we emphasize the importance of trying to think about how we can uh, develop more robust practices of crisis prevention. Because we, we want to try and create a situation where security dilemma sensibility is explored, tested out, and where there's the, de the development of trust between these uh, leaders and that, you know, there was a moment where, uh, you know, these two leaders looked nuclear war in the eye and they recoiled in 1962 and we have to build, and what came afterwards, of course, was a very different relationship between the two states. Neither of those two leaders were the same after that nuclear crisis. They were both transformed by it. And the fascinating counterfactual is what would have happened if they'd met for a second face-to-face -face meeting after the Cuban Missile Crisis? And I think it would have been a very different meeting to the one they had in Vienna in June 1961. And of course, Kennedy's assassination uh, in uh, November 63 robbed us of the opportunity to see how that detente that developed after uh, the Missile Crisis might have, might have played out. Thank you both. Thank you for the question and as well. Uh, you have a question? Yep. Miguel. Ladies first. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all. Thank you, Dr. Nicholas. Um, I'm from India, by the way, okay? And uh, yeah, that was a very theoretical explanation. Uh, in your speech, you mentioned several times about India-Pakistan India war. Uh, and you also talked about how these three con two countries have gone to war three times, right? So your idea in terms of SDS, when you see, because India is powerful than Pakistan, and whatever happens at the line of actual control, LOC, we see a kind of hyper-nationalism in the uh, Indian media, okay? In that context, uh, 
we have already gone to war three times. Supposedly, this is a hypothetical scenario. Uh, if we again go to war at the LOC, what is the possibility of the war escalating to nuclear crisis? Because do you think that there would be no STS uh, between the two countries existing or we would slip into a nuclear crisis? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really interesting question. I, I mean, the... The lesson from the missile crisis, I mean, no one would have expected at the start of the Cuban Missile Crisis that Kennedy and Khrushchev would develop a bond of trust. Um, because they went into the crisis in a relationship of deep distrust. So it's a fascinating case study for us to think about, is how did that trust develop? Now, obviously, some people would say, you know, there wasn't, trust didn't develop, and the crisis was settled by material factors. But I've argued, you know, that I think trust was important, um, and but it but it was very much unexpected given where they started from. So um, in in the India Pakistan nuclear crisis that we've that we've had to date, it doesn't appear that de escalation has been made possible um, through the development of uh, shared security dilemma sensibility and trust. So then that raises the question what led to the escalation of those crises and what are the implications for the future now you could argue that what led to the de-escalation of the crises was just nuclear fear so you, what that would be waltz's argument and in his work on india pakistan he very much emphasized that nuclear fear some people would say i think using uh that what was very important for de-escalation in those crises was third party intervention by the United States and that the United States played an important role uh, in, in what has been called kind of brokered bargaining, uh, the title of a book on this topic, uh, and that the third party uh, involvement is an important factor in the de-escalation. Now, it seems to me that, that um, a, a further factor to consider is whether SDS might, as with Cuba, have come into operation had the crisis be, been uh, es had these crises escalated more. So, for example, if Balakot hadn't have been de-escalated in the way that it was, uh, and there's of course debates around what explains that, then if it, but if it had become even more severe, and then would at that point back channel uh, diplomacy and so on, have potentially uh, opened up spaces for de-escalation. Now, the work I do with BASIC, as part of the BASIC ICCS Nuclear Responsibilities Program, uh, is exploring this concept that we've developed of nuclear responsibilities uh, to try and explore uh, ways in which it might be possible to develop uh, um, crisis uh, channels of communication in crises that emphasize uh, the points that I was making about the Cuban case, this shared recognition of the responsibilities that we have to avoid conflict, this need to rec to empathically communicate with the other and to show that we that we understand their anxieties and fears and that we're looking to reassure and that operating on both sides. So, so, and and we do that through third party facilitated dialogues working with Indian and Pakistani interlocutors to explore how um, uh, security dilemma sensibility might be nurtured and created in these environments. Because, as I said, it's very it's very difficult to engender security dilemma sensibility, but it's critically important if actors are to place themselves in a position where they're open to reassurance rather than intimidation. So I think there's really important research to be done about how far security dilemma sensibility and trust were present in those de-escalations. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on that, but also going forward, what can be done to uh, cultivate a culture where, where both sides are decommissioning the enemy images that you that you alluded to, and the uh, the bad faith models that each applies to the other, in ways that open up spaces for cooperation and even trust. Thanks.
Thank you, Professor. Uh, we have another question over there. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for your speech. Um, my name is Paul Miguel Madeira. I'm a geographer, so my question is going to be a little bit different, perhaps. Um, I I tend to agree with you um, on um, whether uh, a Trump administration approach on this war on uh, Ukraine would be different from the current administration's approach. And my question is about the thing that puzzles me that in this Biden administration approach, it seems that uh, the United States are going to further um, give more weapons to Ukraine, more powerful weapons, uh, um, planes. We don't know where this is going to lead to. And so uh, sometimes I, I have the feeling that the strategic deterrent is no longer functioning. There is not a fear of uh, a nuclear a response at some point. Uh, for instance, if Russia should choose to use tactical nukes in Western Ukraine so that uh, Western uh, weapons could not reach uh, Eastern Ukraine and so on. Uh, where does this may lead us? What's on view on, on, on this situation? Uh, is there not at all a risk of a, a nuclear response at a point? May we be uh, trustful on that? Thank you. Well, I, yeah, I and mean, I think this is very difficult. I mean, the, the, I think the United States has tried very hard to calibrate uh, the military response in such a way as to do everything it can to support Ukraine to take back its territory, but at the same time, not to push Russia over a red line where uh, it it considers that the situation is so desperate that it's willing to try to use nuclear weapons, a kind of roll of the, a final kind of roll of the dice. I mean, the nightmare scenario is that you don't want Vladimir Putin in the situation that, you know, the Germ Germany believed itself to be in in 1914 where it, it had to strike uh, out because it believed the net was circ it was closing in. So so it, it it it's but but if if the it, the, the the difficulty is how how much uh, how much risk are we willing to accept as an international society of Russian nuclear use by uh, in terms of you know what what, what 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 how much do we think it, how likely do we really think it is that Russia would use nuclear weapons if the United States and NATO were to support Ukraine still further? Well, clearly, you know NATO's made a decision that it's not going to directly uh, intervene in terms of direct military intervention, but it's but it's obviously with the decision over the F-16s and everything clear and you go back to where we started clearly there's been a massive significant escalation in the support and so on so is there a point at which ukraine is so successful on the battlefield that it tips that it tips over and you know a lot of people think crimea could would, would be a kind of an issue there but of course it's in the russian interest to play up the possibility that they would use nuclear weapons to intimidate NATO into not supporting, and crucially the US, into not supporting Ukraine more. So the more Putin wants to plays up the nuclear threat, the more he indicates the possibility that he might use nuclear weapons, the more that then scares us to think, oh, well, we've got to be careful that we don't then do more. So th that's where the game of um, trying to convince the other that you're willing to get on the escalator, going back to shelling and everything, be, be, becomes very difficult. I mean, m my own view is that there clearly is, you know, a, sig a, a risk of nuclear use in a way that, you know, we haven't seen for a long time. But I don't see at the moment uh, a situation where I really can see how there would be any, how there would be any really military uh, or political 
uh, advantage that could possibly be gained by by using a tactical nuclear weapon. So, and it would be such a taboo, you know, break the taboo that's been there since 1945. And I think you know there's enormous pressure I, I, on Russia from China to 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 not engage in any kind of nuclear threats and escalations. And given that the relationship between Russia and China is one where Russia is very now, you know, uh, that relationship is very important to Russia. I think that's a further break. So, you know, I I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd be wel- I'd welcome other people's thoughts about this, you know, but. But but my sense is that we're not that that it's going to take something something dramatic would have to happen in the conflict for it to tip over in that way. Now, if if as I say, Ukraine was to be highly successful and was to take back the territory and was to drive into Crimea and was to look like it was going to completely take uh, control over Crimea take Crimea back into Ukraine's sovereignty, then that's where I think people and you know might want to ask the question whether that then pushes the Russian decision-making calculus to a point where there could be some sense of, well, if we this is this is the moment where we have to do something, because you know, how far then is it about regime survival and so on? But even then, I the, when I think that through, I, I do struggle to see even even at that point whether that you know and even if of course then the other thing is you know even if Putin were to give the order to use nuclear weapons would it be followed through you know there's always that question about in the end whether people would say no <laughs> we're not going to do it this is just so that then that's the power of the taboo I think you know that and that's the you know Whilst in the long term, I have grave fears about whether nuclear deterrence can last out across, you know, decades and centuries to come. I think at some point, it's very hard to imagine that that unless we find a very different way of organising international relations, there won't be some use of nuclear weapons. I don't see the danger uh, as, you know, immediately closing in on us in this situation uh, as things stand at the moment. Hopefully that that's sort of, it's given you some encouragement maybe, but at the same time, you know, there's, you know, you can, you can never say never in international relations, both positive and negative, uh, you know. So we always have to be kind of, and so that's why it's very important to look for ways to de-escalate, of course, uh, and to try and find a way of, bringing this conflict to an end, but that's extremely difficult, I think. Thank you, Professor Vida. Is there any question? Yeah. Thank you, Professor Nicolas, for the keynote um, conference. It was certainly interesting from a theoretical point of view, especially for those that we are involved in nuclear issues, no proliferations, and this type of topics. My name is Valeria Puga. I am professor of the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Ecuador. And well, I have two questions. One is purely theoretical, I may say, um, that has to do with the nuclear taboo. I don't know how, if there is any relationship between your concept of um, the security dilemma, sensitivity, sensitivity, and the nuclear taboo that was um, developed by Professor Nina Tanewal. And the second one has to do with the um, degree of predictability. Because as you know, in the strategic studies, I think the ability of predicting the future, the variables, this is of course really important. To what extent this concept of security dilemma sensitivity allow us to predict to some extent if we have more chances to go in a war or to drop in a bomb. And uh, especially taking into account that we have many other factors playing, not only personal or psychological factors, but also we have corporative interests, uh, interests from other parts of the states or even the military divisions they are competing among them. So how can 
we predict or what could be the variables to identify if a leader is having this type of sensitivity or not. Thank you. Thank you. They're two very interesting questions. Um, on the taboo, um, I don't. That, that's interesting. I haven't thought about the relationship between between these two things. Um, I, I don't think there's an immediate relationship because, for me, the taboo is fundamentally the idea that there's a fundamental moral uh, veto on using nuclear weapons. Um, that, that there's a that 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 it's that that these weapons are stigmatized fundamentally. Their possession isn't uh, um, universally stigmatized because obviously the treaty, the non-proliferation treaty, recognizes the two different states. But of course, there's the commitment to global nuclear disarmament. But 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 the use of the weapons is fundamentally stigmatized. And I think Nina did a great service to the to the, to the profession, to to the discipline. By by developing this idea of the of the taboo, and I think it's a really important one. It's what I was saying in response to the previous speaker that anybody that uses nuclear weapons, you know, is breaking that taboo, and and we shouldn't underestimate the power of the taboo, and we should do everything to entrench it and support it. And of course, that's why I think Putin's risk manipulative behavior, particularly in the early stages of the crisis, by making those statements about nuclear weapons and so on, that was a real. That was an, you know, a significant outlier from, and, and of course, and it came only a few weeks after, you know, Russia had committed itself as part of the P5 commitment to, you know, to the Reagan-Gorbachev statement of a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. So there was this fundamental disconnect between what Russia had said in this UN forum, um, you know, in, as, sorry, as a member of the P5, and then, of course, you know, Putin's uh, saber rattling. So... So I don't think SDS has a direct relationship to the taboo. I think they are different things. So maybe it's just worth then in terms of your second question, just thinking about what, what I mean by security dilemma sensibility. So it's the idea that a conf it, it's the idea that a conflict might be driven by fundamentally uh, both sides failing to understand that the other is behaving the way it is because it's fearful and insecure and not because it's got malign or predatory intent. So, so rather than seeing a conflict as driven by, by your adversary being uh, having fundamentally malign intent towards you, you recognize that your adversary's behavior may be driven by fear and insecurity. And crucially, you recognize that you may have done things that have created that fear and insecurity. So, so what the the I what what Boove and I were doing with the concept was we were drawing out a security dilemma theorizing, crucially, the work of Robert Jervis and its concept of the spiral model in his 1976 classic perception and misperception in national politics. We were drawing out this idea of, you know, um, that in order to uh, unwind a spiral of military security competition that's driven by misperceptions, actors need to understand that they're actually trapped in a spiral. They need to come to that awareness and understanding. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to elevate that to a conceptual category and say that this agentic element, this element of agency, needs to be really thought about and theorized and because it's critical to to de-escalation but but the point about security dilemma sensibility is is that it's an intuition or a belief it's not a guarantee so the the most dangerous situations arise where people operate with misplaced security dilemma sensibility and so um you know when when chamberlain goes to munich in 1938 you know you could argue that he's operating with 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 this you know misplaced Security dilemma sensibility. Empathy is not is not is not what's needed in in Munich. In um, you could argue in September nineteen thirty eight. So I never want to be read as saying that 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 the exercise of security dilemma sensibility is a, is a guarantee that an adversary has peaceful intentions. That has to be tested out. Now 
I think what your question points to is that there, there are debates then within the government, within the bureaucracy, within the military about whether SDS is an appropriate way of uh, uh, framing a conflict or not. So, for example, you know, going back to the India-Pakistan case, you know, one of the study India-Pakistan relationship in my book, Trusting Enemies, uh, in Chapter 7, um, I look at the relationship between uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the Indian Prime Minister, and uh, Noah Sharif, the, the Pakistani leader. And I argue that they developed shared SDS and trust, and that this was most evident at their meeting in Lahore in February 1999. Uh, um, but crucially, uh, the Pakistani military did not accept that interpretation of the conflict and, and did not have any security dilemma sensibility towards the Indians. Believe that the Indians were still intent on um, breaking up Pakistan and uh, felt they were in this zero sum conflict with India. So, and, you know, uh, General Musharraf, who was the chief of the, of the army at the time, he actively operated to undermine any kind of peace process and launched a military operation covertly that led to the Cargill War uh, in May 1999. So I think studying levels of security dilemma sensibility and trust between different actors in the bureaucracy is a really interesting thing to do. And one of the limitations of my book, Trusting Enemies, is that I focus on the leader to leader level at the sort of uh, and top level diplomats. But there's a but a lot of the recent trust research work that's been done by or in my in my um, group and wider is looking at the role of different actors in the decision making process and what levels of security dilemma sensibility and trust they have to towards the the adversary. So I think you know I think there is definitely some interesting things there. In terms of predictability, I mean, I, I think that's very difficult. What we're trying to do, Marcus Holmes and I, is produce a theory of the conditions under which we think social bonds will develop using microsociology. And then we can test those conditions out in concrete cases. Um, and trying to understand why those components come into play, as I said, sometimes and not other times is really fascinating. But I think that's as far as I would wanna go in the predictability direction. But if you look at some of the articles I mentioned, you can see that we explore some of these questions further. Thank you, Professor. Um, our time is up right now. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Professor Rilla, for that informative and thought-provoking uh, speech. Uh, hope to see you again. Um, some logistical thank issues. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some logistical issues, you know, um, the coffee breaks will be placed on the outside in Patshu. Um, some several uh, panels will be located in the room 90, which is right next to this aud auditorium. And also uh, for the ones who are looking for something to eat during the lunch break, there's a canteen in this building. You can buy something from there. Okay. So, uh, the next panel will be at 11.30 uh, in this auditorium. Okay, thank you.